Hello and welcome. My name is Kristina Stojanova and I'm an associate professor at the Department of Film at University of Virginia. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight the film Amar Court, made by Fellini in 1973, but also to dwell for a while on Fellini and his uh, indebtedness and relationship to Jungian ideas. That's why the talk is called Fellini and Jung, Dreams, Memories, Reflections. The success scandal of La Dolce Vita uh, in 1960 was met up in arms by the Catholic Church, but also by international film critics like the founder of Cahiers du Cinéma, Jacques Doniol de la Croix, who, who claimed that the film was chaotic and lacked the structure of a masterpiece. Understandably, Fellini suffered a prolonged creative block which triggered a serious midlife crisis. He turned for help to Dr. Ernst Bernhardt, founder of Jungian School in uh, Italy, uh, who became his friend and analyst. Under his influence, Fellini started keeping a dream diary. Despite Dr. Bernhardt's death, Fellini's interest in Jungian uh, psychology grew and in 1965, he even visited Jung's home in Switzerland, the so-called Bollingen Tower, where Jung's youngest grandson, a passionate fan of Fellini's films, showed him into a room where the famous and then mysterious red book was kept. Beautifully drawn and handwritten by Jung, the book contained Jung's dreams and explorations of his unconscious from the period of his creative illness in 1914. Jung worked on the red book or Liber Novus, or the new book, for 16 years from 1915 through 1930. The book was only published in 2009. Obviously, this visit encouraged Fellini to continue his work uh, on his own dream book or books almost through the end of his life. Thus, the first volume, approximately 245 pages, goes from November. Uh, 1960 to August 1968, while the second 154 pages goes from February 1973 until the end of 1928, a span of 22 years, which is supplemented by other scattered pages and several notes dated 1990s. However, long before he ventured into the oneric universe with the cognitive tools recommended by Dr. Bernard, Fellini was well aware of the importance of dreams. Indeed, he often asked his friends to tell him their dreams and urged them not to waste what he called the night work. He considered that night work at least as important, if not more so, than the thoughts and activities of one's waking hours. He was a versatile illustrator though, uh, as he could, uh, as could be seen from these sketches of the main characters from Estrada. Ferenis' own dream book was published for the first time in English in 2003 and re-released in a new centennial edition this year. It covers Fellini's dream where uh, its cover features Fellini's dream where Pope Paul VI who as a cardinal had condemned La Dolce Vita vehemently, ascends with Fellini in a balloon basket and points excitedly to a blimp-sized beauty in a bathing costume whose exhalations, he explains, create the clouds in the sky. And here are some uh, of the images from uh, Fellini's dream book, which are sorted out uh, or grouped uh, uh, by topics like food and meals, the Oscar, which represents Fellini's um, emotions when he got an Oscar for life achievement, uh, childhood dreams uh, where you see uh, uh, Fellini uh, sitting on a potty on a bed and uh, uh, facing a giant figure. He was obsessed with giant figures, but mostly female but we'll talk about this later. Um, these are some images from cinema. They are nightmarish or wishful thinking, whatever the dream has told him, women, and then more women. 
And then Fellini and Picasso, dinner at Picasso with Giulietta Messina, and then some sketches to Dolce Vita. Fellini, Jung, and the individuation process. My discovery of Jung was important, very important, not in changing what I did, but in helping me understand what I do. Jung confirmed for me in an intellectual way what I had always felt, that being in touch with your imagination and your unconscious was a gift to be nurtured. Uh, individuation, according to Jung, is a developmental psychological process during which the individual self emerges from the undifferentiated unconscious. Individuation could be understood as an equivalent of, of becoming who you are. It could be also synonymous of a, with a quest for wholeness or self-realization. Uh, in order to achieve uh, individu uh, individuation, uh, the person, a person, uh, should uh, graduate through a series of milestone, milestones. Uh, he or she should actualize, so to speak, their persona, followed by their ego, the shadow, the anima, the archetype of the wise old man or the wise old woman, if it's a woman, and then uh, to reach to integrating the self as a final stage. All of these milestones can be clearly found in a Fellini's eight and a half. Yet even before Fellini's Jungian awakening, uh, Dolce Vita makes clearly visible the main character Marcello's coming to terms with his own personal shadow, as well as with the individual and collective shadows of Roman social and intellectual elites from the 50s, as each episode there demonstrates both the seductive and the destructive side of, a, of the eponymous sweet life. Archetypes and individuation in Amar Court. Thus, after 1963, Fellini's films, while always already allowing for the fantastical, took a distinctly oneric turn. Especially powerful in this respect are the ones made in his so-called middle period, with the clowns made in 1970 and Roma in 1972 being two of the finest. And by the way, you have seen both Eight and a Half and the Clowns. These are films that are, have been referenced here. Amar Court means I remember. Here, Fellini happily skewers some of his favorite ta targets, that is, family, school, and church, in tracing his alter ego's Tita, difficult struggle for individuation. In Tita's world of teenage rebellion, authority figures are almost hopelessly out of touch. Amar Court shows us how Tita makes his own world out of pieces discarded or castigated by those in control. Tita's teachers babble on, oblivious to student mayhem, while Tita gradually sets on the path of maturity and individuation, first coming to terms with his own persona and understanding whether he need indeed wants to be like everybody else in the class, like for example, the collective, masturbation scene where we see him and his three friends masturbating in the car and shaking it. In Tito's world, the good is always shown with the bad, since like in Dolce Vita, Fellini relates inextricably the warm sentimentality of his memories with the demonic and shadowy side of individuals and society. Tito's family, as they say, is as ineffective as the Italian parliament allowing Tita to live at a tangent from its most serious concerns. And the persona of a good Catholic or an obedient son he has put together to meet their expectations becomes increasingly difficult to sustain. Obviously, funniest are the figures of authority like teachers, priests, and the fascists. That is, all of these who take themselves very seriously. And certainly it is his own family whose daily life abounds of absurdist and surreal episode like this one where his mentally unstable uncle uh, climbs up a tree and refuses to get down 
the whole day until they find him an, a woman. That's why the scene is called I Want a Woman. Like Fellini's other alter egos, Guido Anselmi from Eight and a Half and Marcello from Dolce Vita, Tito's emerging ego is demonstrated forcefully in his rebellion against the church, of whose duplicity he is increasingly conscious. And when Tito wanders into the confessional, the father energetically investigates his sexual scenes, forgetting everything about his torment, internal turmoil, and true spiritual needs. In Fellini's universe, true freedom carries a profound and heavy weight. Fascism intrudes on Tito's tango with the adult world. The boy is both drawn and repelled by the seductive world of easy answers, pageantry, and power, which Mussolini promises. More meetings with the anima. But amidst political tumult, life goes on and Tito becomes changed and chilled by the winds of winter, a boy beginning to live the more private life of a man. Apart uh, from his um, voyeuristic escapades uh, in following La Volpina, the town's prostitute, um, he, his interest in the lovely Gradisca has been merely a, ro a raunchy obsession shared with the other males of the film. Gradually, however, it becomes a private pursuit as the experiences with sex becomes more confusing. In a shadow is in a snowy square, when he is for the first time in the film truly alone, it seems as if his dream of Gradiska's favors must be realized. And yet, the ultimate meeting with the anima is represented uh, in Fellini's films by the recurring dream or the recurring image of a giant female. Though I was born by the sea in a place to which people come from all over Europe to swim, I never learned to swim, writes Fellini. In one of my earliest dreams, a recurring dream, I was drowning, but I was always saved by a giant woman whose enormous breasts were huge enough uh, to shock me in light of her statuesque size. At first, when I had this dream, I was quite terrified, but after a while, I came to expect the giantess who would scoop me out of the water and cuddle me between her breasts. There was no place in the world I would rather have been than right there, squeezed between those huge breasts. As the dream persists, uh, persisted, I came not to uh, to mind almost drowning because I was confident I would be rescued in time and the erotic thrill of being between her breasts would again be mine. A dream has recurred to me over the years. As a young man, I had the dream very often. Uh, the dream persisted through my middle age. Recently, I have had it less often, only sporadically, and I suppose the reason is obvious. It's one of the vivid sexual memories in my early life. And I just would like you to see a, a little uh, collection of images of voluptuous female uh, figures who each manifest Fellini's uh, anima, like Sylvia in Dolce Vida, Saragina in Eight and a Half, the tobacconist in Amarcord, the colossal head emerging from the lagoon in Venice in Il Casanova di Federico Fellini. And certainly that image from his own uh, book of dreams. So if you'd like to hear how Jungian analysts interpret Fellini's lifelong obsession with the giantess, do come to the Zoom discussion on Thursday, December 3rd at 7 p.m. Uh, and we will be discussing both Amarcourt and La Dolce Vita. I will be leading the discussion and I'll be very happy to do that. Uh, you can register on the RPL website to get the Zoom link by searching Film School in the search field. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much.